uh, Discord. Uh, I see we have also Stokar is in the, the in the audience. Clock Shane and Teddy are three speakers. Thanks everyone for being here today. Let me uh, share my screen before we get started and kind of run you through the agenda of today. This is the uh, Game Builder community call uh, from the Cartesi community. Uh, and today we have a pretty cool agenda. So for anyone watching this, we are also recording this call. Um, and yeah, you can join our, disc our developer community on Discord by scanning this QR code. We have these calls on a monthly basis or every one and a half months. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we love to jam on, on game ideas, uh, discuss, um, what the community is up to and, uh, also, you know, occasionally invite some guest speakers. And today Stuckhorse is here to, to talk about, um, autonomous worlds, on-chain games and what he's, he's building at Minter's world. Um, but let me get to the agenda actually right now. Uh, so we will have two project presentations starting with ultra chess, uh, another project presentation you've probably heard of this game it was codenamed dinder uh dazzle uh will be presented as well uh by the theorist team and we will have our guest speakers stockars thanks so much for joining uh, uh and then you know get into discussions and q a so really hyped um i think we can get started blockchain i think if you um request to speak we can bring you on stage and uh, you can start sharing your screen so yeah, hello guys, this is Ultra Chess, the on-chain AI chess arena. So why is chess important? It's important because it's very popular, right? Over 600 million people play it, probably more, right? It's a thousand plus years old, right? And yeah, there are crazy popular websites like chess.com and Lie Chess, right? which get a billion plus um, users, right? And there's billions of games, or I think quite a bit of games monthly. Yeah, so it's it's popular. There's a big uh, market for it. So machines have been playing chess for a while, right? In the 18th century, right, the Turk was sort of the first pseudo-automated um, chess engine, but with a concealed uh, human a theoretical paper that was published by Alan Turing um, for the capability of playing chess, right? And, th and then 89-96, right? Um, world champion Kasparov defeats a chess engine called uh, Deep Thought twice, right? It wasn't that good at the time. And then later on, right? IBM's Deep Blue, right? became the first chess AI to beat a grandmaster in a match. Right? And since then, right, chess engines have basically been beating humans, right? Uh, 2017, right, AlphaZero beat Stockfish, right? So AlphaZero becomes a, a new chess engine, right? And then Leela Chess Zero defeats Stockfish, right? And then, yeah, basically the present day, yeah, humans, stand no chance against uh, these bots, right? So the next step for chess or ultra chess is to embrace this uh, AI, uh, this AI invasion, right? Currently online chess is um, heavily bodied, right? So there's a lot of AI assistance, right? You don't know if you're playing against a, a human that's using an AI as a tool, right? And yeah, so it makes sense to um, embrace the AI invasion, right? Fully on chain, trustless behavior, no match fixing, right? So the bots act in a um, predictable manner, right? They don't they're not controlled or managed by a human that um, might have malicious intent, right? Might fix a match by making the bot perform worse. Um, so you can win a bet or something or a wager, it. Right? If you put the bot on chain, that, that, um, that's basically impossible. And yeah, putting it on chain also allows you to keep a record, sort of a, a, a 
cool record history of um, basically all bot progress, and all bot games and human matches, etc. But yeah, introducing Ultra Chess, right? The an incentivized on-chain AI chess arena where uh, bots can compete against bots, humans can compete against bots, and humans can uh, compete against other humans um, and wager chess matches, right? So all chess matches could have um, value based on them, right? Also, third-party wagers can be... Uh, Bets can be made, right? So people that aren't even playing a, get, a match can uh, place a bet, right? And also you can bet on yourself, right? And then in addition to all of this, right? These chess AIs are NFTs, right? With actual value, right? Meaning you can buy one of these chess bots, right? And then have that bot make money for you in your sleep. So introduction to the players, the um, market who would use this and why. Uh, chess enthusiasts, right? People that are already interested in chess, right? A good portion of them would find this interesting. Um, developers, people who already build chess engines, uh, they would find this interesting, right? They'd be able to build a bot and monetize their efforts, right? As opposed to just building a bot for... Um, the fun of it and then also traders right i mean uh people who are interested in uh making wagers placing bets or buying bots and flipping them whatever there's a market for a lot of different um people so how do the bots work right so they're all uci compliant right uh, risk five executables meaning right uh, uci compliant is basically a interface for interacting with um test bots right it's um standard interface right that all uh, chess engines implement allowing them to be basically integrated with like different uis and um it's basically allowing a computer to communicate with a chess engine right so um it's, it, it makes it very easy to um, basically compile any chess engine and upload them to Ultra Chess, basically. Uh, and then they're also risk five, right? So you can't just upload, a, a, you know, a Stockfish Spanner. You have to uh, compile it to um, risk five and then upload it to Ultra Chess, and then it'll just work out of the box. So Stockfish will work. Uh, Lila would work. Um, Basically, any UCI compliant chess engine that can be compiled to RISC-V, which is basically all of them. All right, so buy, sell, trade box, right? So, yes, on there, this is basically, uh, I guess, the coolest part about this is it's an on-chain AI marketplace, basically like OpenSea, right? Where people just, I mean, people that aren't really interested in building their own bots or programming their own bots, they can just go in and buy bots, right? It'll probably be a similar UI to OpenSea where you just search the market, right, and speculate on the value of bots. But actually, you're, you're not really speculating on it, right? You're actually doing due, due diligence, right? You're looking at uh, match history and the ELOs of these bots, right, um, and the earnings of the bots and how much money they've earned uh, and who, who who are the original uh, creators of these bots, and then you're... Divided, you're um, reducing the value of the bots from um, all that information. Yeah. So yeah, it's powered by Cortesi. Um, so yeah, that's why the bots have to be uh, compiled to RISC-5, right? This Cortesi machine is a RISC-5 later, right? So um, yeah, we're only bound by the um, the execution of a Linux runtime, right? And that's what it's enabling, um, basically any UCI compliant chess engine to be ported on chain, right? And then also um, computational capacity, right? Um, you can do a lot of uh, compute or, um, yeah, it just allows us to do a lot of compute by running, by um, using Cartesi. slide yeah 
So the UX goals, of course, are it's, the goal is uh, to make it as easy to use as possible and to make it completely indistinguishable from a Web2 application, meaning right? you can choose to um, view all the sort of Web3 information right, within the UI. But for the most part, um, it'll, it'll be um, Web2 centric, right, from a UI perspective. Right? Uh, no transaction pop-ups, right? Unless you want them, you can opt in for them, right? And then, yeah, just everything that is Web3 will be abstracted away, right? At first glance, right? But then if you choose to dig into the UI, you, you'll eventually be able to see, you know, tr transaction data and, you know, gas and all that stuff. And then this is some gameplay of like the early UI, right? So this is a video of me deploying a bot from my computer that actually um, compiled native um, on my computer. Right? That seawall, the chess engine that I didn't write, someone else did. Um, and yeah, you can see I'm actually um, uploading it through MetaMask, which won't be a thing in the future. It'll be Web2 off. So right now we're waiting for a uh, pop-up notice pop-up in the bottom right corner that says I created a bot. So I'm going to click on that and then we're going to go to our bots um, profile page. And then this is, you just created a bot basically, right? So this bot right here has a random ID 933MRLBD8V, right? You can, you can call it whatever you want. Like you can go to manage bot and then change the name of the bot whatever you want, right? And then you can see it has an ELO. It has um, a name, its owner is me. Um, yeah, I said it has an ELO. It also has a nationality, right? You can uh, verify the nationality of a bot. That's uh, another feature, right? Um, and then it can auto battle, right? You can set it to auto battle and have it just automatically challenge people. Um, based on a certain interval. So like maybe like, let's say every 10 minutes, it can go out and challenge someone for a, um, a fixed amount, do you see? And then you also see the um, auto wager amount, right? You can specify how much money uh, you'd want uh, your bot to go out and, um, and battle people for, right? So yeah, all automatic. So this bot can either lose money for you or make money for you in sleep. this is an example of a bot versus a human right so this is me i just challenge a bot and now so yeah my address is f39f in the bottom right and then the bot's address is uvd96d right and then, as you can see i have like 51 dollars right in my account you can see that in the upper right corner and you can also see it in the bottom of the ui right and then the bot has zero dollars uh, right this bot is set to actually send use the balance of its owner so it's always gonna have zero dollars regardless right and as you can see this game is uh a wager it has a wager of 300 dollars, right so whoever wins this game basically um wins 300 dollars. and as you can see the bot just won right? so the bot just gave its owner 300 dollars, right and then as you can see i'm stuck at 51 dollars, right Actually, it would have been nice if I had shown the process of actually joining the match. So you see my account balance start at $351, right? And then when I enter the match, uh, I deposit $300 into this game, right? Into the wager, right? And then when I lose it, I don't get $300 back, right? The bot gets it and sends it to his owner, basically. Yeah, so that's that. And then this is an example of bot versus bot gameplay. And here I actually show um, the process of challenging a bot, right? So here I'm gonna challenge a bot for, okay. So I currently have 420 and I'm gonna challenge it for $69, right? And I'm gonna challenge it with my own bot, right? I selected a challenger and so I'm going to wait for um, the owner of this bot to accept the challenge. 
and that's going to be on another screen. So I don't think you're going to see uh, me accept it. But as soon as the owner of this bot accepts my challenge, you're going to see my balance go down. Okay, so I accept it here. Yeah, awesome. So I drag it in and then I accept it. Then and that's on another account that owns this bot. You can see as soon as I accept it, a game it a match is ran, right? And then you see it in the finished games, right? So you can see here that my bot actually lost, right? So I lost sixty nine dollars, and that's what got me to three hundred fifty one dollars. So right now we can view the history and autoplay it and see what happened. See how I lost that money, right? So at the top is actually my bot. And the bottom is the um, opponent's bot. Matches would just most of them would happen basically just automatically, right? Because these bots would just every 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever the interval is, they'll search for matches um, and balances will change just in a completely automatic manner. if the match is uh, intense enough or it's long enough or whatever then this match actually wouldn't be finished it'll, a portion only a portion of it would get finished and uh, it'll run in the next uh, in interval mm. so sometimes you actually there'll be some suspense actually and you won't know whether uh, a bot is gonna win or not bingo yeah so black one, nice. All right, lost six hundred dollars. Sweet. So yeah. So yeah, that's what works now, right? We have human v human, human v bot, bot v bot, marketplace, a marketplace where you can actually trade bots, which I should have shown as well, and also wagering, which you saw. In the future, some ideas. Test matches could also be NFTs. There could be a puzzle mode where bots generate puzzles, right? And humans or other bots try to solve those puzzles in a certain manner, right? By using like a, a certain amount of compute or search time. And they can potentially earn money for solving those puzzles, right? Um, there could also be an alternative chess experience that the platform could, um, support there could also be um sort of a bot elo class where um certain bots there uh, are um compete in certain elo uh ranges for um based on like their time controls and also the compute resources that they use right so some bots will be more uh compute intense right others will be, be very quick right so that it could be sort of like a featherweight a lightweight type situation where there's different uh, classes, different bots, and also on chain identity, right? So each bot uh, or each human would uh, verify themselves, their humanity, their um, location, or um, their nationality on chain, right? Um, and then also bytecode will be verified, right? So this sort of creates a, a more trusted environment or a uh, for people who mint these bots, right? You don't want to just go and buy a bot from a completely random person that could have been copied from another person or from another bot, right? You want you want to buy bots from trusted sources, right? To prevent, you know, you know. And then also distributed our protocol revenue. So yeah, portion of uh, all the wagers will a fee will be taken off, 
and I mean the idea vaguely is that um, that revenue will be shared amongst you know I guess people who are invested in the protocol and put it into vague terms and yeah that is it yep that is it that is chess the potential future chess ultra chess yeah join the discord and twitter that's github importantly where all the code is uh yeah that is it thank you thanks clock chain yeah super hyped about this one guys definitely um we'll, we'll share the links as well after the call because uh, the qr code is maybe not ideal but um yeah definitely join the discord follow the twitter i think this is uh you know great opportunity also to get involved start testing soon and uh yeah i'm really hyped about this one thanks again for presenting and taking the time eddie do you want to jump on stage i think you have to raise your hand uh or sh you know request oh there you are invite to speak Welcome, Teddy. I will stop sharing my screen. Hopefully, you will be able to share yours. And Hello. you will as well, I think. Hey. Hey. Let me try sharing my screen. Great. Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All yeah. right, perfect. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's not like a question to blockchain, really. It's more of the summary uh, after his presentation. I think yeah, it's like 16, 17 people here right now sitting and enjoying uh, games in crypto. But what, what I see, especially after a blockchain presentation, is the, the beginning of the, of the era or the, of maybe even industry of blockchain gaming automation tool and bot, smart contract bot in general. And I think what blockchain is doing with chat right now, like uh, it's it's amazing, but it can be easily generalized and extrapolated to all the on-chain games that will come in the future, and especially for the games who, which are maybe session-based, uh, as as the one I will present today, or maybe like grand strategy games, uh, also session-based. Even Dark Forest was was session-based. All these games can be easily uh, can can be easily played by the humans. But also, I see huge potential in the market for uh, for smart contract related uh, smart contract bot. So it's it's like amazing thing thing what blockchain uh, is doing right now, and uh, I, I believe I believe, I believe it's going to be a huge industry. So uh, I'm really happy to be here and uh, being able to see it as, as one of the first people in crypto. So uh, keep on keep on uh, doing the amazing job, man. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially in all perfect knowledge games, basically, it will be dominated by AI. If it's perfect knowledge, then, yeah. Yeah, even, even, even with games that, that are not necessarily perfect knowledge, uh, you can still have a lot of, like, uh, strategies implemented, like in the Rex Monaco, and also things like uh, you, you can, can judge the probability of the outcome, like with Go, for example. So these kind of things can be automated, and I think... Uh, even if there will be a huge market for people just enjoying those games and playing them, uh, I believe that most of the on-chain games will need uh, those wagering systems between players so we can get on the level of competing uh, in eSports or just sport, but for everybody due to the crypto network. And then uh, it's, it's going to be like, there will be a lot of people in crypto who are just interested, okay, I want to buy this bot from some developer because I see it performing really, really well. And I just want to take my money on, on, on it and let it play. So we'll have this mix of automatic, of people building automated strategies, compete in those various games uh, for a profit, of course. And also like the mix of human players who will still have a lot of edge because, well, it's like with the market. If you have the very clear edge, uh, maybe you can automate the execution. But if your strategy sucks, uh, even if you automate it, it's gonna, it's gonna be bad, so and, and you can lose money. So I, I think there will be a huge market for what you are doing right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'm leaving the station, like uh, focusing on the on presentation. The so, Teddy, go on. <laughs> uh, 
I guess uh, for everybody that can't see my screen, I guess you guys can uh, just open up the PDF and if I'll, I'll just I'll just say when to flip to the next page then. Perfect. All right. Okay. So um, for those of you that have um, listened to what have we well before uh, previously, it's been called uh, Tinder. We've recently changed the name to Dazzle, and. Um, in short, it's basically a match three strategy game that features NFTs and battles and other NFTs, and it's backed by Cardassi technology, of course. And what Cardassi Rollups provides us is an ideal solution to provide transparency and fairness. Uh, basically, everything, everything on the matches are tracked and visible. Um, Computation is performed on the Cartesian machine, so it guarantees correctness. And since everything's on there, it can be proved and tracked. So before I go into the details, it's probably best to just watch a video on what it is first. So the backstory is that uh, all of our NFTs are creators, creatures called Dazzles. And they're living in this world that's surrounded by darkness, and they're going on a voyage to this sacred mountain to to get the source of lights. And for some reason, probably due to game, gaming constraints, they form in teams of threes, and they just like to do that. And basically, they're competing with each other to fight for the light sources. So. Uh, there's, t uh, like I just mentioned, there are teams of threes, and they each characters have different unique skills, elements, and um, attributes based on their gears, and they they play on a shared puzzle board that um, features a um, match three strategy game. So. Uh, the key features of the game is that, of course, it's using Cartesian technology, so all of the game results are provable. There's NFTs for the characters, uh, which I'll talk more about in a bit. And later on, we're also thinking about more um, parts such as gears and add-ons as NFTs. Features basic uh, match three puzzle games, and it's a turn-based battle system with leaderboards. So for our NFT, well, we've designed it in such a way that there's around 14 uh, different body parts, ranging from their uh, standard headgear, uh, body armor, uh, a weapon, a sidearm, and also different accessories, including like background effects and ground effects. So overall, there's right now we have uh, basically a lot of combinations because of so many body parts. There's like I don't even know how to like pronounce the the number for that. It's fifteen to to four power of fourteen combinations. And um, there's multiple ways to acquire NFTs. So right now, for our first version, we're planning to have three different modes. Uh, so the game itself, to encourage uh, new players and casual players, we want it to be free to play, where players can play the normal um, PvP mode and normal PvE mode that doesn't require them to buy NFTs, and lets them to uh, acquire NFTs, such as in the PvE mode, which is a... Um, a uh, se seasonal boss that um, players compete on a leaderboard and players that rank on top of the leaderboard um, get to acquire the boss at the end of the season. And of course, um, 
for the more premium series rewards, they have to be play, required through playing the tournament mode, which requires the usage of contested rollups. And for this mode, each player has to have three NFTs in order to actually play. And they require tokens, and they have to <coughs> uh, link up their um, built-in wallets to play. So this gives us abilities to verify the game results. It gives potential for um, esports uh, scenarios, and because of the this level of security, we're comfortable with giving more valuable NFTs, and we're thinking about uh, doing other stuff like offline tournaments and things like that. So this is basically a quick overview about the architecture where the front end client communicates with the Cardassi rollups. And, and we also have a uh, centralized backend that acts as a harvester to um, basically uh, aggregate the data from the rollups to speed up things. That's pretty much it for uh, for us right now. And so we're getting close to um, doing some pre-alpha testing. So for anybody that's interested to learn more about the game or try it out, uh, we strongly encourage you guys to join our Discord or um, follow us on Twitter. Thank you. Thanks, Teddy. Uh, again, guys, another really cool game. Definitely recommend uh, joining the Discord, uh, following the Twitter, keeping an eye on uh, what they're doing, and uh, really hyped about uh, Azel, as it's called. I like the new name, name as well. <laughs> um, it's great. I think uh, we can um, open up the stage to uh, Stuck Arts, unless there were like some immediate questions. Um, and yes, welcome back on stage. Yeah, great. So I'll wait for any questions for, to Teddy or blockchain. Then just start my presentation. Does anyone already have some, some questions for Teddy or blockchain that they have that they'd like to ask? Well, Teddy, maybe maybe I can ask the question. Is the whole logic of the game also uh, the smart contracts? Uh, sorry? Uh, I, I, the sound cut out at the end. Oh, sorry. Okay, so my question is, is the game's logic also built with smart contracts or are you using like JavaScript or something else and then only you know, only adding smart contract lay later when it comes to NFTs and maybe other systems? Right, great question. So the logic, uh, basically everything besides the NFT is built using a Rust. So we basically uh, compile it to risk five to get it to work on courtesy nodes and um, basically i think it's just a generation of nfts are smart contracts okay great thank you very much so answering your question uh all the game logic is uh, verifiable if you try to cheat on some result on a random number or nerfing a character or anything you can just uh, have anyone proving it was tampered with because anyone can just uh, dispute the competition on Cortez. yeah it's really great uh, because uh, we, we also had this problem where we wanted to add some randomness but also knew okay if this randomness will have the source uh, like from the oracle for example it's not really a great <laughs> randomness sourcing when it comes to the blockchains so our, well, our idea was, okay, let's let's source the randomness directly from the blockchain and do that. But I'm happy to see any like, uh, other options, that, that there are other other options. I only heard about the case, of course, but uh, seeing that you can verify the outcomes of the game with, with the technology where guys building here, uh, it's amazing also. Thank you. Thanks, Stockards. Yeah. So to quickly introduce Stockards, um, He's building on-chain games as well. He's quite active in the autonomous world, uh, on-chain game space. Uh, I mean, Stock Wars, you can also uh, maybe give a good intro, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like you're sharing a lot of great educational content 
on autonomous worlds. You're also building your own game or more than a game, like a whole you know, autonomous world of its own, maybe, uh, you know, yeah. Pinterest world. Uh, and love, would love to, and yeah, again, thanks for being here and would love to hear more about what you're building, how you see the space and kind of share some, some you know, some, some insights about autonomous worlds and on-chain games overall. Sure, yeah, perfect. Uh, like at the beginning, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I've been I've been completely immersed in crypto and fell in love with it since like 2017, uh, when I was just in high school. So it's it's been a quite quite long walk uh, for now. Uh, I've been I've dropped out from applied mathematics studies to pursue a year in blockchain uh, and in crypto in general. I've worked as the as a educator for many years, and also I had the pleasure to be working with Binance as their uh, content content manager and also translator for many years. So I was working a lot with uh, a free edu educational content when it comes to crypto and basically delivering all the knowledge, knowledge I could get in very simple form to the people. Uh, I was also a trader for many years, like a uh, professional one, a uh, full-time job. Uh, again, again, uh, I've been immersed with DeFi. I think I've tried most of the DeFi applications that are on the market. I uh, also uh, fell in love with NFTs and the visual identity they are giving uh, to the people and, and especially the groups. So I think of, of NFTs as like those uh, those trinkets of the ancient tribes that gathered together in, uh, on the internet and found the, the shared identity. So that was my thesis about the NFTs. And once I've heard that there's something, something called Dark Forest, uh, and to those of you who don't know what the Dark Force is, it was basically the first playable fully on-chain game. It was the experiment of can we program something that's not financial in nature on top of the Ethereum? And can we make it in an economically sustainable way? It was back in 2020, and those guys who built it showcased that maybe if we think about Ethereum as this general programming computer, uh, big decentralized third state, first in the history of our of the humanity a computer we can also build things that are not DeFi in nature so in DeFi we only use like swapping locking tokens uh, with nfts we basically have the pointers pointers to jpegs so the usability of all of these systems is pretty limited mostly limited to, to what we already knew from like traditional banking industry with some twists of course and also, like uh, with NFTs, uh, we already know a lot about collectibles. So putting it on the blockchain wasn't really that unique, but it, after the huge, huge growth phase of our whole industry, so I'm pretty glad we saw that. With autonomous wars, and especially on-chain games, are, I would say, the first try of saying, okay, if we have blockchain networks and Ethereum, and we view it as a programmable computer, can we really build something else on top of it? So it's like our tinkering with basically what's possible on the experimental stage. And I'm happy to share with you uh, the thing I've been working on for the past seven months, basically. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's go. It's a very simple game that's running on the blockchain right now. And uh, I think I think yeah, it's, it's going to be great. So but let me start the presentation. Awesome. Okay, I think I need to yeah, share my screen. <clears throat> okay, I need to reopen Discord. Uh, so, like, back in this. All right. I just shared also, probably most of you guys are familiar with uh, Dark Forest, but just shared it in the chat as well. And um, definitely liked these ideas. Star Wars is back. Okay, perfectly back from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. Okay, you should be able to see everything in a second. Yeah, it's loaded for me. For me too. We yeah, have. for me as well. Okay, can you see everything? 
Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thing. Once again. Okay. Uh, it's good now. <laughs> you're, you're on the click to exit full screen. Not sure if. My God. But, yeah. All right. Kinda... <laughs> <laughs> now it should be okay, right? I think we're gonna no, do it that way. Actually, yeah, it's okay. All right. Uh, A little, little bit rough, but okay. Who cares? Okay, it should be fine. Okay, so my 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 idea with multiplayer crypto game started basically when I was going through all these DeFi applications and NFT uh, NFT projects and thinking, what if we first combine those things? Secondly, add more utility, and third. Uh, explore new, explore new new frontiers in how we can basically interact with those applications, and naturally, it came to me that maybe something like games can be a suitable format for that, because games are quite quite unique. So you gather people, you set up some rules uh, of, of the system, and you basically say, okay, now all of these people who are here can compete against those rules, and let's see uh, whoever wins. And it came to me, okay, maybe this is a, like a perfect idea for crypto in general. Like, if you, if you go to Twitter or Discord or, or anywhere where the crypto community is gathering, you will always see that people are very highly competitive and are looking into new ways of basically making more money in crypto. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who are very fundamentally driven with crypto technology and know how it will, and it's allowing right now for a more secure, better internet and especially financial transactions. But most of the people, so the biggest product market fit in crypto is basically allowing people to compete for something. And well, multiplayer games are basically perfect for that. Because you have all these rules, you have all these players, and they are just clashing against each other. And whoever wins uh, gets the rewards. And historically in games, the rewards has been only like, um, non-real, not real, it was digital items that, have, that, that didn't have any value outside of those words. But with crypto, especially with things like ETH and uh, any, any other on-chain assets, we can leverage this crypto network and help people to play the games with the real stakes. And you can think of it, of it as basically digital hunger games, like boosted with crypto networks. So that was my idea in the beginning and uh, it also came down to okay now how we can program those things on the, on the blockchain and is it even possible okay so just a quick rundown through the team uh, it's basically me right now and five five developers uh, who are who are building this stuff and if anybody is interested uh, to talk more about it uh, after my my presentation uh, you, you can reach out to me on Discord or, or Twitter. So the general idea uh, is like, is we want to build multiplayer games on smart contracts because then we can verify everything and it gives us a lot of compatibility. So again, like it would DeFi, where you can safely compete for any on-chain asset. Uh, so you specify some rules which we call games, and then allow players to compete for assets. It can be ETH, it can be NFTs, it can be uh, real-world assets for it on-chain. It can be NFTs, it can be whatever, you can generalize it. It's what also blockchain was talking about. So we create games, and then we allow people to compete for assets in a very, very safe way, in a very provable way, and in very accessible way. Because blockchains are one of the most easily accessible technology in our world. So anybody, uh, doesn't matter from what jurisdiction, what country, what race, what gender, whatever, can access those networks, can access this technology and use it safely, like anybody else. It's a very level playing field. So I think for games, it's going to be also. We had the first presentation of uh, like very early experiments, very early concepts with that. So how we can create massive multiplayer games 
that are directly running on the blockchain. And it, there was a, an early experiment called Dark Forest. It was running on uh, Gnostics chain, but it was very, uh, it, it wasn't really costly efficient. But what it's what it showcased was first we can build those things. Uh, it's possible to build those things and run it on top of the blockchains. That's first, and there will be players who are interested in that kind of playing. And also with smart contracts that are open source in nature and published, so everybody can see them on Ethereum, for example. We will have people who will come into your game, uh, will come into your world, and basically expand this world. So it's like modding, but that makes better. We already saw that with Dark Forest. We also saw that with Xerox Monaco, for example, and the spin-off called uh, Xerox Titans from Metbox DAO, where people were writing their own smart contracts, and uh, those smart contracts were basically strategies represented as the cars who are competing against each other. And you could just come in, take the smart contract of the game, add some rules, and create a new kind of experience for the player. In that particular scenario, when it comes to Xerox Titans and Xerox Monaco, it was a tournament for uh, Web3 uh, for crypto crypto uh, teams. And it went great. Sure, it's a niche for now, but we can expand that, we can generalize that, and we can allow for a much better experience for basically all the crypto, crypto people. So what, how, do, how do we even build those things? First, we take smart contracts. So all the game's logic is uh, inside the smart contract itself. Everybody can prove it. Everybody can run it on their own. Uh, it's permissionless. It's very accessible. And it's, I would say, even eternal. So the game will, for the eternity, be running on the blockchain itself. So for, uh, for as long as Ethereum exists, and there are nodes which are hosting Ethereum, uh, your world, your game will also be hosted. And we saw that problem many times happening in the traditional gaming world. Where, for example, recently, uh, Chinese World of Warcraft servers were basically shut down. And each player lost lose, uh, lose all of his of, of, or hers um, items, all the history of the, of the progress. So he could have spent like 10 years uh, working on this account, but due to the legal things of the company, it was shut down. It was taken away from him. So we we did it differently. We build those games with smart contracts that can be verified, can be provable, can be run by uh, by the blockchain network itself, and anybody can play it, even without developers. Uh, once it's deployed and ready, uh, it's eternal. That's why we open source that. It also allows for a very easy modding, and with modding comes open economies. So you get all these benefits that uh, NFT people are dreaming of. So you also have the very easily provable ownership of any given assets that that are on chain. And we saw that already happening with Dark Forest. We saw that with Xerox Monaco. But for me, what was missing? It was like the the most important component. Uh, you can imagine on chain games as like the dish that they could prepare us. And it was fine, but for me, uh, being in crypto for many years as a user, like from the user perspective, what was missing in those games, like the, the, the most highly competitive aspect of those was how can I challenge other players? And if I win, do I get any rewards? And we saw that happening with Axie, for example, but, but the, model, the model of Axie Infinity was broken because you had very inflationary token and bad token things. So basically, during the growth phase, it was amazing, but then everything collapsed. And we, did it, we want to do it differently. So you allow for uh, zero zoom, basically, at the beginning, of course, uh, competition for assets. And it can be like really, really huge. It can be like drop lottery, where you, had, where you had thousands of thousands of people competing on one battlefield uh, for one big reward. You can design in many, many other ways. But the core premise is uh, we want to take those games and we want to add this very highly competitive aspect. Uh, we know from sports, we know from esports. So where people, teams, bots, whatever, compete for some assets. Some real stake in the world, I would say. 
So yeah, uh, for me, from the user perspective, and what kept the kept the adoption of Dark Forest besides cost uh, was that there was no no reason to play those games besides like traditional reasons uh, when it comes to gaming. And if I want to play games, uh, there is like amazing, amazing and huge gaming industry in the world uh, where I can go in, tap into the billion players and compete and just play with them uh, for free. So why would anybody build on-chain games? And that, for me, this is the reason. And we saw that each time when, for example, DeFi was introduced, NFTs were introduced, each time people in crypto have the ability to say to safely compete for something, and if there is a new way where in how they can compete for something, they will come in and they will enjoy it. So I think that those highly competitive multiplayer games are, are basically the future of crypto consumer markets and the way we'll use we'll be using blockchains and filling the block space in the future. But this component was really missing from those games. And yeah, I think that's that basically, uh, when, when you think about crypto itself, uh, what's the main reason, uh, what's the main use, reason people use crypto? Like what's the best for the market? It's basically agents competing for assets. And those agents, of course, can be bots, can be automated strategy, can be... Uh, but in the end, you have this big bucket of agents who are basically competing ag- uh, according to some rules specified in, for example, uh, centralized exchanges, and not trying to extract the value from each other most of the time. You can also build those systems in a, in a positive sum. That's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's possible. <clears throat> so our first, our first inter- uh, our first game, our first idea was let's create something very simple. Uh, with a very simple rule so that the smart contract layer can be uh, basically cheap to play. And uh, let's make it session-based, let's make it highly competitive, and let's make it really complex in potential outcomes so that the game won't be repeatable, uh, the game won't be, uh, won't, won't be like, uh, finished, won't be, won't be easily, easily, uh, so you, you can't really guess the outcomes very easily. You can only like predict them, and you can only like uh, you can only play according to those outcomes. So uh, we've built Rascal, which is a pod racing game, and we'll be debuting it very soon. Uh, but for now, I have a very short intro about it to just uh, prompt prompt you guys into the lore. So a long time ago, there was a famous Avatar show, and everybody in the in the in the metaverse visited it uh, because they were traveling and they just sit in this avatar shop merchants bounty hunters collectors all of them would gather there play together compete for the most precious 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 treasures and they would do that on the track of rascal and this is how the game looks like right now you have four players who are joining the room uh, who are joining the the tracks of rascal they have four ships, and the condition to win is very simple. So, uh, what you need to win the reward, uh, either you are playing for fun or you are playing to compete, uh, to compete for if, for example, or any other asset. Uh, the win condition is pretty simple. You just need to make a full lap with one of your ships. You have four ships. You can deploy them according to the rules of the game. But the condition to win is just make a one full lap. Then you finish the race and you are a winner. And again, the gameplay is also pretty simple. So we are building it according to, uh, to the knowledge I got as a user. So I want, I want the game to be very easily understood at the beginning. I want it to be like test. So 10, 15 minutes to understand, understand the rules of the game. But then to actually be really, really good at it, uh, you will need like thousands of hours to master it. So the gameplay is pretty simple. You roll for the movement, you get the random random uh, commit reveal when it comes to the movement, and then you can decide, like, do I move my one of my ships? Uh, do I deploy a new ship? Do I use any skills, for example, to kill enemy ship? 
uh, do I use the bonus movement? Do I dash one forward? Do I root them the ship? And with those very simple rules, what what turns out to be like a very simple game at the big, at the at the rules level turns out when you have like four players making the, those decisions and uh, thinking do, do we accelerate the game? Uh, how do we move our moves? How the board is changing? How the racetrack is changing? How the positioning is changing? Uh, you you run into a very high highly complex uh, outcomes. So it's great, and I think I think uh, you will like it once we once we release it. And this is basically how the legendary game mode will look like. Uh, so you can play Rascal for uh, let's call it for free. Of course, you will need to play Gas Piece some gas piece but uh, you can play like uh, for free with your friends just to level up your uh, rankings ranking rewards but also you can go into the legendary game mode and this is where you compete for assets so that's that's the most fun part uh, especially to me maybe not for everybody else but for me this is where you compete for assets and you can join with anybody in in the world and just play it, specify, okay, we I want to play this game for like 0.01 ETH. And are there three other players in the world who wants to do the same? If yes, uh, we all gather together and play Rascal according to those rules. And whoever wins, whoever is the fastest, wins the money. And that's basically it. What we also have is, it's more for the casual players, but I think it's gonna get more traction uh, also uh, for, for also be among like more skilled players, more hardcore players. But if you just want to play Rascal and have fun, uh, that's that's amazing. That's great. Uh, we have this ranking system where uh, once you complete some actions inside the game, so for example, win the match, uh, kill the enemy. Uh, there's a list of them, of them. What you do, you have the on-chain ranking system, which automatically gets updated with all the uh, all the previous game states and we can do that because it's on the blockchain of course then you have this soul bound nft usage for the ranking achievement system where uh, your experience in the game is really highly and easily provable uh, by this by this by this ranking so we end up with for example somebody having the soul bound token of, of and the achievement uh, represent as the achievement badge of trader or maybe a minter or holder or even OG and you will know in a few seconds that that's somebody who's really skilled with maybe with Rasta or maybe in just on-chain games so maybe that's somebody you don't want to compete against or maybe that's somebody you want to have like uh, in your club in your guild in your like, group and so it's a very simple achievement achievement system. And uh, basically that's it for today. Uh, we're going to release Rascal. We are currently running internal playtests and uh, we will be starting some public playtests pretty soon. But you can expect us to deliver, deliver and release Rascal around uh, June and July this year. So if you are interested in crypto games, uh, yeah, you can DM me or you can just go on our Twitter it's called Minter's Ward. And just follow us. And if you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer them all. Fantastic. Really excited. Um, really cool game as well. Um, what kind of like, because you mentioned you were like in the space for a while, you were doing educational stuff. How did you kind of get into like, on-chain gaming and how did what, yeah what was like the, the the tipping point kind of well, yeah it was a, it's a very simple answer i don't know it, it will be like satisfying for many but i was basically using all these applications and i just felt bored <laughs> so that's basically it uh, i was using all these DeFi stuff uh it was fun for for a year but then everybody started doing that and i was really looking like okay how we can build games that will be fun for years because well they are games not really like trading or or like speculation stuff and what's what's the way we we can enjoy those on-chain applications for a years to come and uh, so like very simple rules complex outcomes uh once you get some players it's gonna be great and 
basically it came naturally to me okay maybe we can build games and then also i was i was thinking okay so should we build like traditional games but that's something like everybody else are doing uh, right now and how do we even implement crypto in, on top of that so i'm i'm for like uh assets ownership and i think it's gonna be powerful but assets ownership without like anything meaningful uh, is it's just like collecting useless jpegs so uh, what do we even build and how do we how do we connect those things so we can build traditional game and add nfts on top of that but is it really like crypto way of doing things so it quickly got me into okay if we can uh, build things like agent a and then agent b swapping tokens between themselves can we can we stimulate for example movement system on top of these transactions like uh you you can you can figure out as a yeah so you have agents and they are performing some transactions and can we with that emulate the movement on the on the on the board for example or the movement uh, movement on some uh two-dimensional plane so that was my idea and then i found our forest and got me into thinking okay it's possible so what's the what's the what's the next stage for that and uh if, if there is even a market for uh, on thing games and i think i believe uh, right now it's very small <laughs> you can't really play on thing games there are not many of them uh maybe two of them are alive but when you think about the way we are using block space right now in the blockchains we have like we have a wonderful infrastructure are all, all over the place we have very highly perf- highly performant blockchains but we are missing oh, are the applications so who's mining the gold like everybody are giving picks and shovels like who's mining the, who's left to mine the gold and you see okay what's the biggest on chain application <laughs> and it's like uniswap uh, and that's it and how are people using uniswap it's basically for uh, trading meme coins and <laughs> especially right now and so what are the applications we can even build on top of the, on top of the blockchains right so maybe we can build multiplayer games and that was that was my thinking i love it i love it i recall reading one of your by the way if anyone has questions please raise your hand or drop them in the chat in the meantime i'll just throw some some thoughts and, and questions i have yeah let's go but uh, i remember reading one i think one of your tweets was that your one of your thesis is is that I don't know, by the year, I forgot what year it was, maybe 2020, 2030 oh. or something? <laughs> yeah, it's a bold thesis. So it's basically uh, me saying, I think uh, that by 2025, 50%, like half of the block space in the most popular uh, uh, crypto networks like uh, blockchains, basically, will be filled by the fully on-chain games, autonomous worlds, uh transactions and like movement etc because when you think like these are uh, those applications are really highly fruit applications okay so you need even in rascal to play one 25 minutes match you need to make on average around 25 transactions okay plus a few more uh, to for example update your ranking system and and that's it so these are very highly fruit applications and what you will end up with is if even like uh what the blockchain is building is going to be successful uh or like what if what i am building is going to be successful you will end up with the daily usage of for example arbitrum for this one application uh mm. at, at, at like 10 percent of usage of the uh, daily usage of the network because these are very very highly highly throughput applications so you will only need like two three or maybe four very successful uh, on-chain games to basically clog most of the blockchains. And I feel that's good because, well, we've built this technology and now we are building ways where we can actually use this technology. And infrastructure, of course, will fall, but it won't be developed in the proper way if we don't have people and players and applications, bots, whatever, using this. And I feel, I really feel like Trading, uh, trading altcoins, it's it's getting bored. Yeah, it's it's getting boring when it comes to using blockchains, so, and we can really use those things in a, in a much but better way. 
Yeah, definitely. Interesting. That's I, uh, where my bold prediction came from. <laughs> I like the bold prediction. I think it makes it could make sense as well because games just attract so many people. It could be a great way to onboard, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, like the Web two folks, and you know, we're oh, still yeah, like a very yeah, for, sure. for now. So, yeah, if I may iterate uh, quickly on top of that, so uh, most of the people, I would say, like ninety percent of humans, human population doesn't even know anything about finance, that's it, or nor really care about finance. We just we just work and we get money, we get credits, uh, we get mortgages for homes, and that's basically it. And nobody really knows how this stuff works, nor, nor they, they care, they have all their hobbies. But non-financial applications, like for example games, are very, uh, very easy to understand for most of the people. They are very approachable, uh, easy to go by, go by with and this is something that can really like onboard people to the blockchain technology tell them why why it doesn't matter without without going into the financial rabbit hole because i know how hard it is i've spent like thousands of hours uh, learning uh since, since, since being in crypto like learning all this stuff from the very very beginning like of not knowing anything about finance so i know how, how hard it is most of the people don't really want to do that, uh, nor they have any incentives to do that. But with games, it's like quite simple. You have the game, and do you want to play it? And maybe uh, you get some unique experience from it, or there's a premise where the game has like a very real, very real, real thing called you can compete for some assets, and it's gonna have the consequences in real life. So it's something very unique uh, when it comes to games. And do you want to play it? Like, if so, uh, you just click the buttons and that's it. You don't really need to know anything about blockchain technology. You don't need to know anything about finance. You just need to know how to play the game. And if the rules of the game are, are simple, well, it's like you have 15 minutes to learn that. The onboarding is quite easy. And of course, right now we need to have the MetaMask connected and everything else. So at the beginning, the clients for all the games we are making now will be just crypto people and i feel that's fine like we have millions of people who who are using crypto on the on the monthly basis so that's fine but once we reach this threshold uh it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna go massively um when it comes to like onboarding folk from outside of the crypto world because with gaming it's easy with DeFi, it's like uh who understands DeFi? Like maybe 10,000 people in the world, something like that. So, but with games, like uh, we have very clear incentives of competitive aspects uh, to play the games. So uh, it's, it's much easier. No, 100%. I also had one question. Do you think there's any room for non-financial sort of autonomous worlds or games? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I even think we we'll, we will try to build something like that. But uh, at the beginning, you you need to think uh, of them as as like product ready on the market and something that will interest people. Like you need to make some money <laughs> from it uh, to sustain your company. So at the beginning, I feel like you need to build those games with the very highly uh, financial incentives in mind. So for example letting the people compete for assets, where you can take fees on top of that. But once some of those companies who are currently building autonomous worlds uh, get better funding, uh, get better, like, uh, they are basically better funding, expand their teams, they will start building fully sustainable, uh, persistent autonomous worlds that will help the generations of people uh, to build things, experiences. Uh, it's going to be like Roblox or Minecraft, but just 10x better. Uh, maybe it's going to be like the dream of the metaverse we are all, we are all dreaming uh, before, but right now hosted on Ethereum and made possible. But to get to this point, uh, because, well, making games is, is quite expensive. So until we get somebody like Satoshi for, for launching games, uh, there will it will be on the hands of the companies who are currently uh, very underfunded and working like uh, making them patent projects and hobby projects 
Uh, so once those companies get more funding, I think there will be a huge, huge incentive to build really non-financial uh, autonomous worlds. But it's going to happen maybe a year from now or like two years from now. At the beginning, you are as a, as a company, you are just thinking of how can we survive on the market, basically. Yeah, agreed. But what do you think these non-financial um, autonomous worlds will look like? Uh, for now, it's really, really great question because I, I have no, I have no idea. Like I've been talking to a lot of guys who are, who are building autonomous worlds, and it's more like for for now, it's more like uh, philosophical questions and answers. Nobody is really coming up with the real designs because it's it's too too early. Nobody knows how to do that. But it's maybe something between like social metaverse. And uh, <laughs> there was a guy who, who told me that his ultimate vision of autonomous words is to basically create the, the hell uh, on the block thing where everybody can murder itself. So maybe maybe that's a non-financial autonomous word that will incentivize people to play. Uh, I don't know. The, the answer to this question is currently, I just don't know. I'm only holding to this thesis of uh, let, let people compete for assets in crypto in a new different way and maybe it will catch up so if you ask me this question in a year i will i will probably know but right now sorry <laughs> that's my best answer yeah agreed i i, I don't think there i in my head my brain in a cell, there's no space for non-incentivized sort of autonomous yeah work. like we'll if if blockchains and crypto history in general tells you anything about uh about the usage it's you need to have a very clear incentives to participate in some decentralized system uh, to govern it or to maintain it or just to play it so there will need there will that there is a need for the incentives like everywhere uh it can be like competing for something it can be like uh for example currency instruments in terms of the uh, in case of the bitcoin for example with something closer to like fully persistent autonomous world without financial incentive maybe it will be some kind of the currency that is emitted to people who are uh, hosting the nodes or something else i'm not quite sure but there will there always even with uh with the hyper hyper structure so uh programs that are owned by by anybody and are just running running on top of the blockchain and are the public utility uh goods even with those uh, there needs to be some incentive structure. So either like uh, Genesis NFTs or like uh, something else or the currency, basically. But right now, our, our, I also feel like our, our understanding of those things and how to build those is quite limited because there really isn't any fully on-chain game running right now besides Mithrium that is economically sustainable and played by many. So first, first, uh, like we had all these great filters on our way to, to really achieve this goal of self-sustainable autonomous world uh, with, with thousands of players. And I feel like the first filter is who's going to play those. And the second is, can we build them in an economically sustainable way? So you don't need to pay like 20 bucks per, per game, for example, that last 20 minutes. And that, that's a huge burden. And before... Uh, before the emergence of uh, layer two, we couldn't really, we couldn't really even even build those. So right now the uh, transaction cost has gone down, and you can you can really uh, introduce a few few of the new designs into into the network. So uh, for me, the, the first great filter is like getting the first players to care about your game, and then uh, making it economically sustainable and viable to run on top of the blockchain, and only like after 10 or 15 steps it's like how do we build persistent sustainable autonomous world words so uh, we need to get through all this way super interesting um I think we're nearing slightly the end i wanted to quickly ask a uh, sweaty yeti you wanted to quickly come up on stage you don't have to but i know you worked on some interesting project during the hackathon was wondering if you wanted to 
um, share a few insights uh, from your, uh, you know, from your experience uh, in the last month, right? I think it was during the month of May. Let me, there he is. Yeah, He's sure. Really um, how's it going, everyone? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't have, I don't have any presentation prepared, but uh, I, I can kind of talk briefly about it. Um, so I've been working on uh, getting the Godot engine running within Cartesi. Um, <laughs> the main blocker right now uh, is that Godot only compiles with Lang. Um, and so I've, yeah, I, I don't really have a lot more insights to share beyond what I, uh, what I had, uh, published for my, uh, for my hackathon, uh, submission, but, uh, in short, you know, at, at this point I'm, I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> thank you, Max. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm working on, uh, building, uh, the LLVM tool chain, um, on, on risk five for uh, you know Cart Cartesi support because um, uh, what I what I've been running into toward, toward the end of the hackathon was I was, I was trying to um, compile playing with the uh, Cartesi built uh, GCC toolchain uh, so that I could then compile Godot with that uh, with that version of playing um, and I couldn't get playing to compile either uh, it was it was running into so the the piece that uh, Godot requires that is prevent like that prevents it from being compiled with uh, GCC is atomic support, um, and I, I guess this has been a long-standing issue with GCC on, on RISC V. It, it doesn't support atomics in C plus um, plus. And so when I when I started compiling, playing with the uh, like Cartesi RISC V GCC toolchain, uh, I was running into the same issue as as getting. Uh, errors on, on uh, errors with uh, atomic support there. Um, so I, I, I've kind of had to take a step back and, and figure out, uh, okay, now instead of compiling, uh, playing with the Cartesi GCC, I have to com cross compile Clang um, onto, you know, like into the same uh, architecture instruction set, uh, et cetera, um, from, from my local system. Uh, yeah, I haven't. My, my day job has been kind of a mess since uh, since my submission, so I haven't had as much time to dig into it uh, beyond that as, I, as I'd like to, but that's that's kind of uh, where it's it's sitting right now. I'm not sure if you tried it, but we have a new build system, and uh, instead of cross-compiling stuff, uh, you can actually run a Docker on RISC-V KMO directly with internet access and everything and use it uh, to build your actual uh, application. So in your case, you could, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say LLVM is better to compile it. You could just apt install LLVM and and use it oh. instead of GCC. Okay, I'll have to try that next. Yeah, I was I was playing with uh, the Godot, uh, the, the, not the Godot, sorry, the, the Cartesi toolchain um, repo when I was doing this for the hackathon. So I don't know if, if that's changed or been updated. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll try that next time. Yeah, because uh, uh, we had this achievement which we were able to support the with this microarchitecture, the standard RISC V uh, modules. So because of that, now we are able to just pick up any standard RISC V distro and use it as right. a base on a yeah on a on a RISC V emulated using Camel on Docker with internet access, build everything, and once it's done, we just pick up this file system and run it inside the Cortez machine. This might be the missing piece, but I, uh, I'll have to dig into that this weekend. Yeah, sure. this, uh, uh, maybe by Monday I'll have Godot running we, in Cortez. You can throw us <laughs> a message and, and we can uh, schedule a call or something to get deeper into this. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Awesome, yeah, it sounds like a really cool project there that you've uh, and uh, been building as well. Uh, and thanks yeah, for uh, yeah. Thank you. So we're we're nearing the end of the call. I feel like these calls are sort of short. I wish I had we had more time to talk. Uh, like also still guards ask you more questions, and I feel like there's a lot of other questions around. Uh, yeah, his game looks have. super cool. I'm looking yeah, you can always. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. You can always you can always like reach out to me on Twitter or on Discord. I'm I'm really happy to talk always. And, uh, and answer any questions, you know. We'll definitely awesome. do that. Cool.
thanks everyone for joining. This is, I think, the end of the call. We'll do another one of these uh, in June. And um, yeah, great, great for, uh, great to have you guys. Uh, thanks for all the speakers, Stockards, Teddy, um, Blockchain. Always a pleasure, and uh, talk to you soon. All right. Thank, Thank you guys. very much, guys. Uh, it was yeah. from the pool. Bye bye. Have a nice time. Bye bye. See you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.